when cosmologists say there's infinities or a singularity, what exactly do they mean when they're talking about space-time curvature? In part five of this series on general relativity, we're going to derive the Schwarzschild metric, which is a solution to the Einstein vacuum equation that describes the curvature of space-time of a large spherical mass basically out in the middle of nowhere. This episode is as math-packed as ever. If you enjoy general relativity, you're going to enjoy this episode. Good afternoon, Benji. Hey, Rob. We're back at it again. Time for more beauty of general relativity. Yes. Right. So at the very beginning of this, we were talking about how I was inspired and wanted to walk through the predictions of um, the of gravitational waves that LIGO confirmed that actually physically exist. And in pursuit of that, we walked through trying to develop the Einstein equation, the fundamental, um, the fundamental equation that creates your basically equations of state for any gravitational system. Now the template for that is this guy over here, which tells us that as we're constructing this Einstein equation, that is going to be some way to measure uh, local space-time curvature, and that is going to equal some measure of matter energy density, right? Uh, whatever causes that, we'll get into it. Um, and last time, we basically got to solving the left-hand side of that. And that's done by, right, this guy here. And saying, okay, you've got the, a measure of... That guy down there? Yes, the, this, this guy here. <laughs> Do that. This guy here, right? Right. And saying, oh, okay, uh, this measure, if I've got nothing on the right-hand side, that should be zero. And this is called the vacuum Einstein equation. And it's basically what, it's the thing that determines what possible gravitational curvatures you could have if there are no sources of energy or matter explicitly in the parts of the universe that you're considering. So, um, and that's actually like a very important thing to look at just in general as far as physics goes, right? In Maxwell's equations for E and M, the vacuum equation is an important place to start I, for, well, a, couple, a number of reasons. One, because it gives you, its solutions gives you very um, real physical systems, all right, physical phenomena. The solutions to Maxwell's equations of the vacuum give you the electromagnetic wave, and they also give you the point particle solution, because what you do is you take your charge and you only consider you only consider the universe outside some sort of spherical area. You put all your charge in that area in that region that you're not considering, and then you look, okay, what does the EM wave look outside that? Um and is this saying that in empty space let me put that. we have no curvature? No. Because it's saying that your Ricci curvature, if there is no, uh, if there's if there's empty space in what you're considering, i.e. equals zero, that this thing, this combination of Christoffel symbols and derivatives of Christoffel symbols has to equal zero. We'll get to that in just a second. So remember, a Christoffel symbol we defined in terms of the uh, space-time metric for your system, right? So basically it's saying, um, where's that picture? Hmm. It's not showing up, but that's fine. Um, I can write these out. Uh, basically, uh, we could say that the Christoffel symbol, which in general is some alpha, beta, ga alpha, beta, gamma tensor can be defined give myself a little bit of room here, can be defined as one half the inverse metric, which would be an alpha, a delta, and then a derivative of your regular metric with respect to a space-time coordinate with indices beta plus 
actually let me zoom in here plus the same thing but slightly different indices oh, i'm getting this wrong this one's beta this one's gamma sorry and beta gamma dx delta suppose okay uh so the the uh christoffel symbols are a measure of curvature all right and the way that you can think about this is actually i can define it in terms of my metric right which tells me which defines for me distances in in space time based on how things are curved mm -hmm. right uh, there's another way that i can I, I can use to find this form which is to say there's a relation if i've got a basis for a coordinate system e right this tells me you know it could be x y z and t it could be polar coordinates, et cetera. If I want to know how that changes, right, the components of those change with respect to a, a different coordinate system or just an arbitrary coordinate system that I'm trying to consider, the thing that will tell me that is this Christoffel symbol, which is I, J, K, E, K. So it tells me that the way that coordinate systems transform right as i move around in them mm -hmm. depends on the curvature and uh, the curvature contracted with uh the initial like the coordinate system that i'm actually looking at okay so this defines the the shape for you right as i move along basically if i know these two things uh if i've got these two uh, uh basis vectors right the Christoffel symbol will tell me that as I move like towards you, whether it does this or whether it does that. Right. Or whether it does this. Okay. Right. Those, those, those coordinates that I have will rotate, right. And change, but I can always describe that change in terms of the original basis that I had, right. The original E vectors that I had, but the way that their components will wrote, will change is defined by, so, or is captured by my Christoffel symbols. Is that how the basis will evolve over position? Yeah. Okay. Yes. That tells you how your basis changes as you move throughout my space. And since uh, e, e usually is a oh, uh, yeah, e usually is a coordinate basis, but it um, an x can be just any general thing that I have. Um, now, oh, right, uh, I was talking about how it's important, why it's important to be able to understand the vacuum equation. Fundamentally, what this is, and actually, okay, so I can define my Christoffel symbols in terms of the metric. I can define my Ricci curvature, that R with the two indices, as a function of derivatives and combinations of Christoffel symbols, which means I can plug everything in and get the Einstein equation in terms of my metric. What's that going to look like? Well... That's going to look like this god-awful mess. <laughs> right? And so what we're asking is, okay. Is that the most simplified form of that equation? <laughs> as far as I can tell. I didn't query it too hard, but it's like, come on. GR is, GR is rough. Um, so basically what we're looking is we're trying to solve equations with, or trying to find, metrics right it's not quite on center let me make it so the nice people of the internet can actually see this mm. okay well part of the picture on the left is now behind your head ben uh true but also i don't know if that's entirely important everyone's seen it this is what this is the partial differential equation that we're trying to solve okay and the solution to it will be objects that look like this, this four by four, 16 coordinate um, matrix. Now, what you'll notice is there's a lot of twos in here. Yeah. What's this guy on the left exactly? What is he? This guy on the left yeah. is this in terms of the metric G. Okay. And which is 
on the right? Um, just zero. Which is zero. Okay. Yeah. It's just, it's this equals zero. This in terms of my metric G is that. And the way that I figure it out is I take that form of that form of my Christoffel symbols, right? I can describe my Christoffel symbols in terms of metric and inverse metric. I take that, I plug it into that equation, which tells me my Ricci equation, my Ricci curvature in terms of Christoffel symbols. And then I reduce it a little bit and kablamo. I have the Einstein equation in terms of metric. And this is why no one uses that equation. Everyone's like, eh, we'll just do this and do computer simulations. Now, the Ricci curvature in a nutshell is? The Ricci curvature in a nutshell is the, the, summation, the contraction of the Romanian curvature. It's a metric of um, how... how space time right changes and the reason is when you can when you contract this the raymond curvature down to something with two indices what that lets you know is how vectors will change in your space as you move around so like right we derived this from the last part by tr by finding the geodesics right, right. the paths of minimum distance in a space that's curved right if it's everything's flat then there's straight lines but the moment you add curvature to your space you get lines that aren't straight right that are minimum right the the distance that is straight from somebody from an outside point of view right right like when you fly on a plane right if or rather no when i drive across a country Everything from my perspective, right, if I take the shortest path possible, it will always look like a straight line to me. But because I'm constrained to exist on the surface of the earth, it actually is a curved line. Right. Right. Same thing here. The um, the minimum paths will depend on the curvature that exists in your space. Right. The notion of straight um changes and so here i should be able to describe uh how vectors in my space time will change right just like how the christoffel symbol gives me how the um the basis right the basis vectors will rotate the analogy here is i can know how my basis vectors uh for a ball on a hill will rotate right given euclidean space but it's the next level of mathematics that that tells me the hamiltonian which tells me how the ball will move in that space okay the ricci curvature tells me how my gravitational balls will roll in gravitational space right because they will follow these geodesics in fact that's ultimately what it boils down to is these light cones right i know that Kind of the fundamental thing that I'm going to pay attention to in GR, unless I'm doing specific applications, is going to be what path does light take, right? Like that's where all of our experimental um, verification comes from because we know that light is the thing that follows space-time geodesics. Okay. Actually, I believe anything, uh, anything should that might be affected differently. Like massive uh, things moving past uh, a source of curvature potentially could take a different curvature, like a different path than light would. Hmm. That would be a thing to calculate. I haven't actually gone through that one. Anyways, we'll just talk about light here because it's easiest. So just uh, so just so we're summarizing then. We said the Christoffel symbol we've got here is going to tell us how the basis will evolve as we are in different locations. Mm -hmm. And then the, is it the Riemann curvature or is it the Ricci curvature that's telling us how... Ricci curvature. How... Ricci curvature will give us... Um, the path that will actually be taken through a particular type of space curvature. Yeah. Because what I'm interested in is if I give you a photon, really the thing that I can define for you is a single vector, right, that like defines its momentum. Right. And then I would ask, okay, in the next moment, where is that vector going to be? Well, it's going to follow a geodesic. 
So, but, but that the thing that I should get out of that, like if I give you a vector and say in another moment, where will it be? Like what vector will it be and where will it have gone? Mm -hmm. I should get out another vector just translated somewhere in space and maybe pointing in a different direction. So I should have an object that when I feed it a vector, I get back a vector. So I need a two index, a, a two index tensor. Okay. Right. Uh, recall from our math thing, tensors are things that it, given when I say a tensor is a thing with a rank like say a rank four, rank two tensor, which tells me when I feed it that many vectors, I will get back a single number, a scalar. Um, and the math, for as far as GR is concerned, the mathematicians will yell at us, but it's fine. Um, as far as GR is concerned, the math works out like if I have a rank four tensor, if I feed it a one vector, a rank one tensor, it'll give me back a three tensor, right? Um, just a quick summation on that. Uh, the reason vacuum equation is so important is because this is a differential equation, right? The, the Ricci curve, the the vacuum Einstein equation is a partial differential equation, a second order one, which makes it much worse than Maxwell's equations and such. But it's still a partial differential equation. And one of the fundamental things that we know about differential equations in general is that you can you can split up your class of solutions into what we call homogeneous and inhomogeneous solutions. Basically, I, did you say homogeneous twice? Homogeneous and inhomogeneous. Oh, inhomogeneous. Excuse okay. me. And basically saying, okay, I've got some differential combination equals zero. And that same differential comb combination equals a function, a function that those, that that differential operator uh, cares about. And the important thing is that there's a, direct relationship between those two between the homogeneous and the inhomogeneous solution um you you get uh one more term when you um have the inhomogeneous oh so this is getting back to good old diffy q yeah yeah, yeah. like like the, yeah. the reason that we are interested Literally in vacuum that. equations okay. and then gotcha like why it's useful to look at vacuum equations basically where the right hand side is zero and then add on the thing to give you like the full Einstein equation right. is because it gives you uh, interesting results, but also like understanding that gives you insight into the inhomogeneous part. I see. Right? Okay. Like anyone who's done just a little bit of differential equations, like that's one of the first things you run into. So finding a general solution first with the vacuum and then finding the particular solution with the inhomogeneous. Right. 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 Exactly. She's got the words. Um, okay. So uh, before we move on to solving the right-hand side, like the solutions to this are uh, actually both the what's called the Schwarzschild geometry and gravitational waves. Um, and these are two solutions are the easiest for uh, just the Einstein equation in general, but they offer some really profound results. And I thought we would, like, it's worth looking into one of them first. Uh, we'll go with the Schwarzschild. Now, is it... Is it a another Einstein equation, or is it a solution for the vacuum? These Einstein? are solutions to the vacuum. Vacuum, okay. Right. In the same way that um, waves, electromagnetic waves, are a solution to the Maxwell's, the vacuum Maxwell equations. Okay. Right. So, um, our our goal is to solve this with regard with an object that looks like that find basically coefficients or functions that go in those coefficients that um solves our equation solves this big thing so what that basically means is i've got 14 or excuse me it's four by four so i've got 16 components to solve each one being a function potentially of 40 space time right um and as i said these are second order partial Nonlinear partial differential equations. Difficult. Yeah, fun. Yeah, they're they're not. <laughs> they're not easy. It's hard. Now, it's not fully that complex. Thankfully, inherently, um, metrics are symmetric, which cuts down the number of independent equations that you have from sixteen down to ten. Right. Basically, those bottom triangular, those six. Um, I guess I can just circle it. Yeah, please. These 
and these have to be the same as far as GR is concerned. Okay. So we only need to solve for one of them and then we'll automatically know the other. Um, and this is an important piece of physics in general, specifically the idea that symmetry of some type reduces the amount of complexity that we have to consider and makes it easier for us ultimately to solve our configuration or our problem. Okay. Um, one consequence of just how um, the Ramanian curvature is constructed is that the covariant derivative of the Ricci curvature um, and another contraction here. This is also equal to zero. These are known as the Bianchi identities. Okay, where this guy is simply the Ricci curvature and I, uh, no, not like that, can't do two upstairs, excuse me, that. I hit it with a, a lowering operator that gives me the same index as before, so I do a contraction. Um, uh, th this is just something you can you can tell by basically how that is built. Uh, it's all white by by how the the le the way this um works. I'm not going to go through it because that's a bit of a nightmare. Um, but it's nice to see. Yeah, 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 the covariant derivative gives you that. So uh, ultimately, you can you can bring this down to only needing to know six components because each of these. Uh, each of the different beta, um, or excuse me, the different alpha, right? Beta is being summed over, uh, is a different equation. So that gives me four independent equations to constrain whatever that solution, that general solution metric should be. Um, and this is like my whole so metrics, yeah, my whole aim on stuff. Uh, yeah, would... wait, what? What do you mean so metrics? Math tricks. Oh, math tricks. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. The idea, like I was saying, is that symmetries mean there's underlying structure that we haven't considered, or there's equations that I can use, and the more equations I have, the more I can constrain my problem, right? I can say, oh, okay, this has to be equal to that, therefore I can, I only have to solve the one piece instead of the whole thing, right? Okay, so the vacuum equation has some of the uh, most flexible symmetries that we can have and if we do it right it lets us reduce the number of equations that we have to worry about so the Schwarzschild radius is going to have a number of symmetries that we're, we're going to impose and say space-time has to have the have these um, symmetries what is the metric that solves this okay okay uh, just remember we were gonna whenever we start a new part we're just gonna kind of make a note of it so that I can Put timestamp saying for everybody. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh. Well, yeah. Here, here we are. Oh, you want me to signpost? Yeah. So yeah. here we're we're talking about this new thing, this idea of symmetries. Okay. Okay. Symmetries, uh, being important to physics. Um, man, I should have put those signpostings in the notes themselves, but that's fine. Billy's got the list over there. Yeah, so the next signpost is symmetries of a spherical solution. Which is exactly what we're going to get into. Okay. All right, spherities are important, and now spherical symmetry is important. Uh, specifically, we're going to say, okay, I want to have a, a solution that is spherically symmetric and static. That's all I ask. Okay. Okay. So what does that mean? Spherical symmetry in space-time means that it is invariant under any rotation, space that I have and upon taking the mirror image um, any uh, it, and, and, w because what's nice is that in any space your sphere is the most symmetric object that you could possibly come up in that space right no matter uh, it's it's got the least features to keep track of basically right um, and a nice thing about a static space-time metric is that you know all of your components are going to be independent of your time coordinate. 
Uh, so that basically tells you, oh, I can reduce the number of variables that I have to worry about when I am including, my, when, I'm, when I'm searching for forms of the functions that go into each of those components, right? All right. So, and wh what came up with that limiting? Is this just what we started with? We said, hey, we're going to start with something that's uh, spherical and static because we think it's going to be simpler. Exactly. Okay. You start. You start with a. Um, you start with an assumption of here's how the metric should behave, and what does it give you? And like for to choose that, like you look at reality basically, and you go, oh, okay, I know behaviors of reality. Well, what does that look like in my system? What symmetries does it give me? If I look at a star, right, to first degree, it sits there and doesn't move, mm -hmm. right? Like to uh, if both in time and space, like, you know, it's just nice, nice and solid as far as I can tell from my local board. Yes, a lot technically, of a lot of caveats they, to that, but technically I got we're you. moving and this and that. I got you. Right. But right. from a particular local inertial frame, it right. looks that way. So the question then is like, if I take those, those apparent symmetries that I see in nature, say that my equation, my metric has to have those things, what can I reduce away? And then what, then when I solve it, what metric does it give me? And that's why we're interested in it, right? Swartz shield radius is nicely described like stellar objects, stellar objects that are um, bound, basically. What would a star look like if I was on a planet that never moved, or I couldn't tell that I was rotating around? As long as it's spherically symmetric, I really can't tell if I'm in a perfectly circular orbit around the sun. Yeah, it's not quickly evolving in time. Right. 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 I wouldn't be able to, to tell that. Um, so, one thing that is nice is that I know from... Let's let's say that the coordinates that I'm going to be using are going to be t, r, theta, and phi. My classical spherical polar coordinates for the space and time, right? Right. Easy peasy. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the symmetries that we just said in order to... Um, it basically eliminate a bunch of coordinates, right? So first up, um, what we know is if if my system is static, right? First off, um, the components must should be independent of my time coordinate, but also the whole space time should be un unchanged when I go from t and reflect it into negative t. Right? If I run this if I run my system forwards or backwards in time, since it's static, there should be no difference. So, that means I am looking for what happens to g mu 0 for um here, like I said, the space itself should be 0 for um when mu does not equal zero. So basically, I'm looking for the these coordinates. Okay? What happens under the transformation to those coordinates when I go from t to negative t? Right? Uh, I have one equation, right? The assumption that this, that my... Uh, system should be static tells me, oh, okay, if I transform, I've now changed the, the, in the system where T has become negative T, I call that G, my metric prime. So this whole column, mu zero, should equal exactly the same as what I had in my old metric, right? Right. This is for T, this is for negative T, right? Okay. Now we know that there is a way on the math to transform between coordinates. 
when we did this in the math section, what we discovered that for a tensor, right, I have another equation that g prime mu zero should equal the partial differentiation of my original coordinates, alpha, uh, differentiated with respect to my new coordinates x in x prime space, basically where t has been swapped, mu times differentiation x. Now, same coordinate space, but now I'm tracking the index beta and differentiated with respect to the new coordinate space, x prime, just the zero component, basically the t component. And that's multiplied by the general metric in the old space. And so remember, I've got uh, upstairs and downstairs alpha, beta. So those are summing away. And what's left over is two downstairs mu and uh, zero. That gives me the balancing of this equation. So I thought it would be a good idea to work out what these transformation matrices actually look like, right? Like what does x uh, alpha x mu look like and then what equation uh, follows from this guy because this is the general math of how to transform the metric from one coordinate system to another versus uh, a truth that has to occur because i know the symmetry of my system okay okay uh, so here i will um pull up here in a sec this guy yes so instead of watching me labor it out i've already prepared this the first term the derivative of my coordinate system where alpha is being tracked with respect to the new coordinate system right is this matrix uh, the let's see if you get into the actual um what's it math of it Sometimes when you have a rank two tensor, there's a difference between there's mathematically a difference between whether it's two upstairs, two downstairs or a mixed here. We're going to ignore that. Sorry, mathematicians. And I'm just going to arrange any rank two tensor like it's a matrix, but technically it might not actually be a matrix. It might not transform the correct way. Um, <laughs> But this, al this allows for a convenient way to keep track of which components I'm saying when I talk about alpha is zero and mu is zero, right? That would be zero, zero. And what I can say is when I construct that element, I can say, oh, okay, I know that alpha uh, x zero, which is my original coordinate system, my original coordinate system is t. And actually, let me just, let me just write that out. My original coordinate system, which is x alpha, is this, and x prime alpha would be negative t r theta phi, right? The only thing is t has gone to negative t, okay? So I go, okay, the zero zeroth component of this transformation matrix is the zeroth component of my coordinate basis, so t, and I differentiate t with respect to the zeroth component of my primed system, which is negative t. Right. So, aha, t differentiated with respect to negative t. And I can fill out this entire matrix, right? If I change alpha to now one, I take the differentiation of my first, of my component one, r, differentiated with respect to my zeroth, negative t. Differentiate with respect to theta for negative t. Differentiate with respect to phi with negative t. Um, and I do that for all of these, um, what's it, for all of the possible uh, uh, combination of old coordinate system and new coordinate system. And I think it's fairly e easy to see that if I take this derivative, that should just give me negative one. If I take this derivative, it gives me zero. This, zero. This, zero. And if I look at this derivative, that gives me one. And then the next and the diagonal gives me one. And the next on the diagonal gives me one. And I'll get zeros everywhere else. So is this the constant. Is this the right. Jacobian? Yes. Technically, yes. This would be a Jacobian. Um, where... 
uh, yeah, uh, an important point with, hmm, eh, this actually might, uh, yeah, yeah, this, this is Jacobian. And the simplicity of this is the simplicity of the fact that I've only transformed, um, one component by changing it, by, by making it, taking the negative sign of it. Uh, this gets more complicated if instead of my new coordinate system being the negative of, what if it's the addition of uh, of R and T as my first component, and then the subtraction of the two in the next, right? Uh, gets a bit complicated. But yes, that is, you're right, that, that does give me a nice uh, Jacobian form. Um, and that's exactly what we make when we get here. Uh, the next piece, let me see. Oh yeah, that's probably enough room. Right. So that is this vector here. The next vector or, uh, factor, I guess, is this guy, right? Well, I look at the derivative of each of these components with respect to just the one. So that's going to give me a vector. And so that tells me that dx beta with respect to x prime 0 is going to be equal to negative 1, 0, 0, 0. That looks familiar. Yeah. OK. So. Um, what do I have? Ah, right. So if I take this, if I do the contraction along here, right, the contraction is beta, um, beta times, uh, uh, so the components, um, the, the four components that make up this times the four column vectors that make up that, right? This basically gives me negative one times, come on, let me make a dot, g, g alpha zero plus one time, or no, excuse me, zero times g alpha one plus zero times g alpha two plus let's get that, uh, g alpha three times zero, right? The components this and actually not equals but leads to yeah which is gonna just be which of course tells me oh this is you have g alpha zero right um oh except right i need to do this lift that guy up a little bit yeah Oh, excuse me. No, no, no. This should be... Oh, that's negative g alpha zero. Um, and what this tells me... Sorry, I, my notation here on the math is a bit ick. Um, but that's fine. So then I can awkward pause. Right. Okay. An important point. Here we go. Here we go. All right, so now what I can say is I'm looking at sorry, it's a bit tricky and there was a there's a thing that you need to uh be respective of. Specifically, okay, now I can look at alpha x with respect to x prime mu and I can do g alpha 0 and I know the negative of that, right? So, okay, so that magenta thing at the very bottom—that's supposed to be 
negative G uh, alpha. Oh, uh, alpha, and then the, the remaining is zero. Sorry. So that should be G, negative G alpha zero. Okay. So this here, then I can say, when I reduce this, this, once I sum this up, it equals this guy at the bottom, right? Because I've carried out the contraction of this operator with the general metric. Okay. Uh, which basically says, like, I yeah, yeah. select, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 the, the either the yeah, you just first row or the that. thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So now I have to take the contraction of this guy with what's left over, which is this equation here. So I go through the steps. Just to be clear, that's a mu next to x prime. Yeah, this is, I got flustered and wanted to go fast, which is always a bad choice. Deep breaths. There you go. Well, I don't want to force people to be here for 10 hours, you know? <laughs> um, right. So this gives me, I'll call it, if I call this tensor T, which is it? And it should give me a, uh, oh yeah, 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 T alpha mu. Right. This this basically says, oh okay, I can track along alpha, so I should have T one mu G one zero. Uh, why are we contracting along alpha now? Plus, because uh, it's in the equation initially, right? The general form for the uh, transformation between the metric in one, one coordinate space and the other has two contractions. It has a contraction across both of the variables in the general metric, and then one of them is contracted with okay. a transformation that depends only on a particular one, and then, yeah. That makes sense? Ish, yes. Okay. Um, because in general, this I have this here. This is uh, T two. What is that clanking? That is Barry. It sounds like. You gotta feed the machine. Indeed. What are you feeding the machine? Uh, that would be vanilla flavored Greek yogurt. Right. Now, just so I'm reading this right. Right. We have G one zero, G two zero, G three alpha, or is that a zero backwards alpha? G four zero. No, this is three. Yeah, um, and so this should the like, what's it? Each of these coordinates sh should match G mu zero prime, right? Uh, now what that means is when I select the value of mu, this coefficient changes. Nobody's gonna be able to see. Oh, that. you're right. You're right. When I select, and let me redraw what T is here, when I select the value of mu, the coordinate of uh, this, th not coordinate, the coefficient T1 mu, or T2 mu, or T3 mu, changes. So this is alpha mu, which, as we said, was negative 1, 1, 1, 1, and zeros everywhere else. So, for example, if I wanted to know the uh, zero zeroth, I should um, the the coefficients I would have would be zero zero. So, draw actually write it out with the mm -hmm. zeros on it. So, so we'll, that what? tells me that g zero zero okay. prime is equal to 
T00, uh, or two, not T00, T10. Okay. Contracted with 10 plus T. Actually, wait, no. I did, I did 1, 2, 3, 4. I should not have done that. We're not doing 1, 2, 3, 4. Some people do that. Sorry. Some people don't. Some people do 0, 1, 2, 3, which okay. is what we've done. All right. Off by one indexing. <sighs> gotcha. The literature is so mixed and it's terrible. So that's 0, 0. Then you would have C10, G10. Okay. Plus. And what you'll notice is that, okay, here, T00 would give me, and actually this should be all multiplied by a negative one, uh, T00 would give me, this is negative one, so G00 and T, uh, G00 and G00 prime trivially equal each other. I actually don't get any information from doing this. Okay, what is that thing on the very bottom? Is that G01? Zero, 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 sorry. Okay. G00 zero, zero, and this. But if I choose, instead of, and actually we were kind of postulating, instead of... My first coordinate being zero, I can say g one zero prime. This should be equal to negative t zero one g zero zero uh, plus t one one g one uh, g one zero plus right following out like that. And what you'll find is, oh, okay, the zero one-th component, zero down to one, this is zero. So that goes away. The one-tooth component, right, which would be, what would I say? Uh, actually, I said, yeah, zero one-th. So the one-tooth, so that would be one and one and then down to two. That would also be zero. So the only thing that survives is this. So that tells me that would be zero. I this is the only this I, is, I'm losing in space where the zeros and ones are in your matrix up there. Okay, sorry. Let me read because it looks like it should have picked the one for two. Uh, yeah, maybe let's... write them all out. Negative one zero 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 one zero zero. So write the zeroth one, zero, one, zero. If I do the uh, T21, for example, that would be T21, that's a zero. Okay. Right? The only thing that survives is the T11 here, right? That gives me a one. So what that tells me is G10 prime, the, so the metric in the new coordinate system, is equal to negative the coordinate in the old system. Is that a negative or what is that's it? That's a negative. That's supposed to be. That's a. Looks like a pistol. Very slippery drawn negative. Okay. So what I have is for mu that's not zero, right? And so this generically is true for the other ones as well. Basically, g mu prime equals negative g mu zero for mu not equal to zero. But at the same time, I know that g mu zero prime should equal to positive, right? The same as what I had by the, by the time symmetry that I'm imposing. So I've got coordinate transform telling me they should be negative each other, and I've got symmetry telling me they should be the same. So... The only way I can resolve this is there. G mu zero is zero. Mm, okay. Right? So basically, the as I go back to my metric that I'm filling in these variables for, I can then say, okay, it must be that these lines are all zero. Well, I see how the ones on the left are that, but how is it the ones up on the top right are also that? Symmetry. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, we already explained that. The yep. metric is symmetric yes. with respect to transpose. Therefore... We're, we're getting it. Yeah. See? So I get to go, oh, okay. These are all... Um, these are all dead. Um, for the same reason, 
right? This would cor these would correspond to you know T R theta phi, right? The rows and the columns as well. For that's uh, for the rotational the the rotational symmetry. It must be that these off diagonal terms also are zero, basically for uh, very similar arguments. Because imagine I've got a hollow 2D sphere, right? If I rotate my perspective, the, the way that a point here, sh the curvature of that point should affect my distance through it, shouldn't change whether the sphere is at this radius or at that radius right when i do the rotation but if i have a uh these off diagonal metrics remember there this is going to be met basically multiplied by a uh a tiny differential dr and a tiny little d theta and so that combination of dr d theta when i look at the line element through it means that oh if i do a rotation the way that the the cur the distance is measured at this point here when i do this rotation will depend on the radius that it's at and the angle that i'm looking at it and that means you no longer are spherically symmetric so those must be zero right because we already said it has to be spherically symmetric. right i'm, I'm imposing that right. on my system so and i just saying the only thing that matters here is just the diagonal Correct. Okay. The only thing that will matter are going to be my components along my diagonal. Right? So basically, I can say, and actually, let's, let's just go to the right here, that general function or general metric, G, alpha, beta, can be described as a diagonal matrix that's just G time component, G radial component, G theta component, and G phi component. Where I've used double index because obviously it's a metric, it's a matrix, so I could use two indices, but this gives me the diagonals. Um, yeah. So ultimately I end up with a diagonal matrix. Um, and the components that I the the components are going to be functions of um, the space time the space time variables I have right t r theta phi we already eliminated t from there because of static right if I have t that enters into the functions that define my components it's no longer static right it it, it depends explicitly on time therefore it cannot be unchanging with respect to time. Right. Yeah. So pretty easy here. If I if I hold my if I explore the space to find when I have a const uh, a constant t and a constant radius, the only thing I have left is uh, two space like directions that must exhibit spherical symmetry right uh, i know the line element in those um, spaces i know that that must have the line element of a two sphere right a sphere, just a 2d nice simple sphere so basically what that's saying so is a circle is that um well no a, a proper sphere a circle is a one sphere mm. Two sphere is a proper sphere that you and I would be able to visualize and basically say, oh, okay, G theta theta D theta squared, right? Because I have to feed it two distance, two distances to give me a scalar, and distance is a scalar, right? Uh, plus G phi phi D phi squared is equal to what I know is my spherical thing if i have a radius r0 then it's d phi squared plus sine square theta d phi squared right and so that basically directly lets me say okay the metric for theta is simply 
are not right the 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 distance that that sphere is or they based on the area of its sphere um, we'll get into why we want to define radius in terms of a of a area as opposed to a distance from something here in a sec uh, and then r not squared not squared theta but this holds the same for any distance away from the uh, any sphere that you uh, construct as long as it's in the space that we're considering um, which tells me oh okay this is the general form for the metric i don't have to have like the specific r is held constant this just is true for any r does it make sense yeah okay so i now have two of the four components for my metric for the Schwarzschild radius. Huzzah. And we got those entirely by looking at symmetry. So it made our job a heck of a lot easier. Now, what I'm left with is, okay, I have now two more components to find. G, T, T, and G, R, R, or radius, radius. Because of the spherical symmetry, I know that the radial function can't depend, um, neither the radial nor the time functions, right? The, the, whatever these functions end up, cannot depend on my uh, angle coordinates. They can't depend on theta, they can't depend on phi. If I do that, it's no longer spherically symmetric, right? Right. Um, but I also know, because it's static, that those functions also can't depend on time. So what I'm left is, these must be two functions. We'll call them B and A. And those two functions depend only on the distance R. Okay? Um, and so now, finally, we'll have to use our... Uh, vacuum equation to solve what is the functional form of A and B. Right, because we already have the final form of the equation. Right. We know we've, we've basically used up all the symmetry that we can in our system. And so finally what we have to do is go to the differential equation and just try and figure out a way to solve it. Okay? So... What I want to be able to do, let's take a step back and remind ourselves then, is I need to take these coordinates, plug them into Christoffel symbols, plug those into the Ramanian, the Ramanian curvature, and then have that Ramanian curvature equal zero. Okay? Um... My life, so so first, let's just give <laughs> a real quick uh, view of how this would be done. Okay, so let's consider, let's consider, um, right, the very first Christoffel symbol. So I'll, actually, my easiest one, the first spatial one. Christoffel symbol... Uh, one, 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 okay? Uh, from the equation for that, I'm going to say two times that, just so that I don't have to do one over. This is going to be G10, differentiation of G01 with respect to coordinate one, which would be R in this case, right? Plus G01 differentiated with respect to here again, uh, x1 and yeah minus differentiation g11 differentiation your g's have morphed into y's x0 they have that is an unfortunate consequence of me rushing through things okay that's one term this continues 
Right. And, and so the way that I know that this is what this looks like, that this... So is that an X prime on, under the third term? No, these are ones. Yeah. This, should, this is a zero. This is a one. This is a one. So it's telling me basically take G01, differentiate it with respect to R. Okay. Right, because that's my that's the variable in the first coordinate for my um, coordinate vector, right? My coordinate basis. Right. Okay. Um, right, and the way because the way that I get this is that I've got okay, I know alpha, beta, gamma with the alpha, beta, and gamma are all set to one. Okay, I've got one with a contraction between the delta here, the delta in there. The delta here and the delta there. But, but what oh. were you putting it? Sorry. This formula, when I carry out the contraction defined mm -hmm. by the deltas here across the one, two, three spots they occur. Yeah. Right. Give me four different terms. Each of them will look like this. When delta is equal to um, zero, I got this term. Um, this will occur for that term as in this yeah this this whole thing right there okay and that'll occur four times over where this number and therefore these three numbers changes to all to to the uh what's it the whole set of variables um the last one and i'll keep here Plus, let's write this more vertically just for the sake of space. Plus dot 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 plus G11 uh, differentiation of G11 with respect to the first variable plus the same thing, turns out one minus exactly the same thing. So actually these cancel out and give you zero. And what's nice is the inverse matrix, right? Basically, remember we defined our regular matrix, our inverse matrix by the idea that it's the raised operator that gives you um, zeros everywhere except along the diagonal and one along the diagonal. Right? That's this. So basically, for a diagonal matrix, it just means take the multiplicative inverse of each component. Spell it out. Um, so, if this is my regular metric, then G55 for... Or no, I'm putting it in the wrong spot. Sorry. G uppercase theta theta would be instead of r squared, 1 over r squared. G upper t upper t, or also known as 0, 0, depending on which one I'm, which <laughs> yeah. bookkeeping method I'm using, right. is instead of b, 1 over b. Okay. So just so we're clear then, where you've got it over there to the left, mm -hmm. that's G sub TT. Yes. G, not, G lowercase not T. Not G times T times T. Right. Okay. Right. These these represent the components, right? This represents the TT component or the zero zero component, depending on bookkeeping notation. Uh, sorry, audience. I'm going to force you to keep uh, with this because that's just a fluidity that comes with GR. Keeping track of both the index. Well, we'll just keep spelling it out over and over. An index and the actual label that I have. Just to reinforce it. Right. Um, so if I look at G10, well, I know that G10, the lowercase, the element of it is zero. Well, the inverse of that is actually just going to be zero. Straight up. Um, the only term that survives is this last one. G, one one, which was um, the inverse of one over R. Well, right, one which over is square. one over a, or a, sorry, R, 
and then the derivative of g11 with respect to x1, or otherwise known as differentiate 11 with respect to r. And so that gives me a prime r, or the differentiation of whatever a is. So I can tell you the Christoffel symbol, 1, 1, 1, is a prime over 2a. Okay. Now, if I did this for every, uh, let's call this alpha beta just to make life, this would be a two by two matrix. And the way this would be, the, the shape of this would be a prime 2a minus r over a minus r sine squared of theta over a and negative b prime over 2a with zeros everywhere else. Now, this is just one index that I can put here. There are four of these. So when I do this calculation, I already have written out the algebra for everyone. I have 0, 1 over r, 0, 0, 1 over r, 0, 0, 0. Then a block of zeros here and the diagonal matrix negative r negative r just, just write the zeros out <sighs> yeah fine okay let's get the oh shoot this is the wrong one for completeness let's write these all out um this is zero zero negative sine theta which actually here i'm just gonna say Sine, cosine, zero, and then zero, 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 zero. That's that one. Sine, cosine? Yeah. I'm just going to say S and then um, C. Oh, okay. Actually, does that even matter? <sighs> yeah, I'll do it here. It doesn't really save space for later, but it's fine. Alpha, beta, three. This is equal to... 0, 0, 1 over R, 0, 0, 0, uh, cotangent of theta, 0, and then zeros everywhere else. Uh, not everywhere else. You've got then mm. a uh, the reflection. And that's too, that, nobody's going to be able to parse that. There. It's fine. As long as they know it's symmetric and they know these terms, anyone who's inclined to actually do this algebra will be able to construct it. I'm not trying to okay. uh, murder everyone who's here and watching. Just kind of give an idea of what it looks like, which is one, two, three, B prime over two B. One, b prime divided by 2b, and then 0 everywhere else in there as well. Okay. Okay. So you take these four Christoffel symbols, you stick them into your equation for vacuum, and what you get out is a set of equations. Um, I believe four, although one of them is redundant, you get a set of equations that depend on A, A prime, uh, uh, that could depend on whatever the function of A, A prime is, B, B prime, and R and theta, right? Like those are the variables that I'm working with. Um, those equations, which I will, for the masochists here, write out the first equation is 4 a prime times b squared minus 2 r b double prime 
times a times b plus r a prime b that's a sad b b prime plus uh, r b prime squared a equals zero two negative two r b double prime a b plus r a prime b prime b plus r b prime squared a minus four b prime a b equals zero right reach some reachy curvature equals zero and then three there we go r a prime b plus 2a squared b minus 2ab minus r b prime a equals 0. And so you have these three equations, a whole mess, to try and figure out what is the form of a and b. And basically this is just going to be, how do you do a partial differential equation? Hooray. A nice thing. So if I do um, 1 minus 2, what I get out is that, very simple thing, a b plus, uh, a prime b plus b prime a is equal to 0. You might recognize this as your product rule in calculus. So what that tells you is that a times b equals some constant k. So now, solving this, right, means just figuring out what A is and you invert it, figure out what constant is, and that is what, um, right, by solving what, either A or B, you've solved them both effectively. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, what do I do? I put equation 4 into the equation I haven't used, equation 3. And what that kicks out ultimately is R. And what was four again? Four is this guy. The fact that A B four? is some K. Okay. Yeah. Is that R times A prime equals A times one minus A. So this is our fundamental differential equation for A because it depends only on A, A's derivative, and a variable R that A actually depends on. Yeah. I can solve this, right? Hallelujah. I can actually solve this. The solution gives me that, okay, A as a function of R must equal 1 over 1 plus 1 divided by some number S and the variable R. Right? This is our solution. Aha, I've done it. So now, I can write out for you my full Schwarzschild radius metric. Okay? Um, or, well, okay. Now what I want to do, and I guess I should actually caveat on this first. What I want to do is to make sure that I can... Um, what do you mean I'm saying? Right. I want to be able to find what the constants S and K are. Because so far they could be any constants. Right? Like this is just a mathematical form that could describe an infinite number of different realities. The question is, which one is ours? Right. Um, so you need some boundary conditions? Exactly. To turn to this, we're going to have to use uh, basically boundary conditions, but also uh, a little more general than that. So, first up, to set my S. Effectively, what I want to be able to do is understand what... What geodesics should I get? And I already like, and I already know a bit of that because I um, know the form of 
the geodesic equation. I know, and here, we'll get that. So to do this, let us consider you've got a tiny, small test particle, so small that it cannot change the curvature that's in the Schwartz shield metric. And you want to know, okay. What does that mean? I can't change it. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, if I look at uh, my curvature in space-time somewhere else, the only thing I see is the Schwarzschild metric, not the Schwarzschild plus this particle. In the same way... So we're pretending it's so weak that gravity has no effect? Mm -hmm. that, that that At the distance between that the That it doesn't cause the curvature to change. It doesn't change the gravity at a point far away from it. This uh, and this, So this, it's an infinitesimal particle. Yeah. This is what we do, for example, this is what we do all the time with um, e and &M where you say, if I've got an E field and I put a test particle here, how does it flow? And you say, okay, it all depends on that E field. Technically, it all depends on that E field where I imagine that test particle hasn't affected the E field okay. that it now is in. Right, like we you. do this all the time. It's, it's fine. Technically, um, when you're predicting like, oh, okay, this particle then moves to this point here. What's its E field there? Well, technically... At that moment before it's moved there, if it were actually a charge with magnitude, it would affect the E field at that point. But I don't want it to do that if I'm making these predictions. Okay, so basically, whatever is creating that short shield curvature is so massive that this tiny particle really mm -hmm. has no effect. Yeah, so relative to the mass of the okay. part of, of whatever your uh, metric is that it just it just follows the geodesics okay um, so it's a tool to probe the field without changing it right and what i'm going to do is i'm going to release that particle with three velocity zero so i put it i just set it down right and i go okay how do you move okay we know we derived this actually earlier that my world line for my world line and my, my, my geodesics for particular form is that the let me zoom out so this feels a little thinner that the total derivative of my particles position which I'll label as x with respect to the proper time that it experiences what's that do hickey on the x this yeah those are that just tells me it's it's the full position vector of the particle okay it's position in all four coordinates right this this geodesic equation gives you basically four equations right each of them depend depicting a uh, different coordinate in your setup um, plus the curvature of your space at that point contracted with dx u or mu dt right d tau dx nu proper differential d tau i know that this has to equal zero this is what gives me a um, geodesic. If I have something that's off of this, then your particle ex is accelerating. Um, we discussed this, uh, I believe, in part three. Yeah, before we got the... Um... No, this was in part four, excuse me. When we talked about geodesics and things, uh, how, how um, basically particles move in gravitational potentials. Um, and then we generalize that to saying, oh, no, this is just how things move in curved space and geodesics are the things that they'll follow as long as nothing is affecting, nothing causes them to change off of that. So an important point, this, um, I believe we might have discussed this, I can't recall. This is your four velocity. So basically there's the speed that um, the the there's the speed you're moving through space like dimensions but no matter what i do i am always moving through space and time right 
right? Like even though you and I are sitting here relatively motionless, we're technically moving through time because the clock's ticking, right? As far as the spatial cord goes. So what this means is that all of your, um, all of your velocity and relativity is concentrated in the time direction. If my three velocity, my spatial velocity is zero. What that means is that the different coordinates for this are all zero except for the um, time-like direction. So basically, uh, this will reduce to saying the only thing that's non-zero is saying, okay, my radial position, when differentiated twice with respect to radius, is Christoffel symbol 100 zero, zero, dt tau squared, and that must equal zero. Um, if I go to my components, because I have that Christoffel, right? So what I can do is I can bring this to the other side, actually multiply it out, figure out what this is with respect to my proper time. Mm -hmm. um, and what I can say is, oh, okay, it must be, according to this, according to GR, that dr squared, d tau squared, is going to be equal to a over 2r squared. And what I know is the Newtonian limit. Specifically, uh, excuse me, this shouldn't be an a, this should be... I believe this is S that we're setting here, right? Yeah. Yeah. And just recall, this is the S from the previous previous mm -hmm. equation that's right above this. Let's just make that go away. Ooh, I didn't have the translation here quite right. Uh, what I know in and all right there in newts that this must be equal to two gravity m or r squared. So, so what, what intuitive leap did you just use to go back to Newtonian mechanics? Uh, what I'm, uh, that allowed you to fill in for S. R is this, this, this component dr squared with respect or the derivative of r with respect to tau squared is a property that since it isn't tau right, since it doesn't have um, gamma directly in it uh, should reduce to the newtonian limit if i'm far away from r so that means the the constant that this sets should reduce to the Newtonian one if I push R far enough. So d squared R d tau squared is acting like an acceleration. Right. So from the gravitational law, g m m r squared. Right. That g m m or that g m r squared functions as the acceleration in m times a. Right. Yeah. Put the uh, the full equation up there. Which one? The um, the gravity equation. I mean, that's that. Yeah. Like that. Um, yeah. I mean, it is just here. You use just regular time because there's no distinction between proper time or whatever. But it's that. Okay. So. Now that we've got this up here, we're stating that the particle is so far away that it simplifies to. Mm -hmm. uh, what what you what you're saying is you know, when R is large enough, the equation has to reduce down to the Newtonian form, and the only thing that changes as R the or rather the thing that will stay the same as R gets larger. Between these two 
is this S divided by this whatever this S is. So the S must make sure that when R is large enough that these two things should be the same, that the constants match. And then I can say, oh, S must be this thing. Specifically here, um, it's in geometrized units. Um, we actually, this is just, I believe, one. And so I get to say that S is equal to negative 2 Okay. Right. Shouldn't there be a G in there? Uh, I think because of the coordinates we're using, we no longer use that. Um, like like G G is effectively one. Uh, so. Here, what I've been using, geometry's units, lets you set uh, a few things to, to one. C, for the speed of light in the vacuum, we set to one. Uh, I believe a con consequence of that is G ends up being equal to one as well. Um, hmm. Didn't write in my notes, but I think that's a, what it ends up being. I was going to delve into that, but then it felt like a bit much, potentially so. Um, I didn't want to buckle us down too much. Okay. Yeah. But, meh. Um, let's see, did I send you that picture? Um, as for K, because... Can you pull the original equations back up? Cause Which original equations? So we want to, where is K right now? K is this guy. Yeah. K, and then we had S. Okay. Right? S has to be that in order to match the Newtonian limit. Uh, K has to be equal to one for to match when space time is flat. Basically, this makes sure that your um, time coordinate gets the one when um, there is no actual curvature. So, like in the distance very far from whatever's at the center of your Schwarzschild shield metric, you should have basically flat space time i.e. Right. implied by when I'm very far away from a star, I feel sp flat space-time, right? So I know it should reduce to um, negative one for time and one for all the um, all the diagonal components. Right, Minkowski. Right. Yeah. So what that lets me finally all of this work to finally put together and say... Do I not just I did okay didn't just put in a picture of it which hey whatever I can finally write out my metric what's a runtime bills anything heard about an hour and a half yeah that sounds about right um we are we're closing in we should be done before two hours okay G alpha beta this is negative 1 minus 2m over r. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. The space like is 1 minus 2m over r, negative 1. 0, 0, 0, 0, r squared, 0, 0, and then r squared sine squared theta. So, this is the Schwarzschild metric. Ta-da. You got so close to spelling it out. So close. Why? You want it actually full? Ugh. There you go. Now we got a screenshot. Why are we like this? <laughs> All right. Or if I hit this with line elements, basically, um, 
actually, let me write out the line element because this will be useful. No, nope, don't do this. Um, distances in this metric are negative one minus two m over r dt squared plus one minus two m over r negative one r squared plus r squared theta squared plus why are you disappearing sine squared theta d phi squared all right now what you might notice about this metric and this this is the um famous like we said Schwarzschild uh, metric and from it we have terms like Schwarzschild radius which will actually get to how we derive um, the notion of a black hole if you look at this line element okay what you'll notice is that there are two points where your distance ds goes to infinity first if I set my r equal to 2m, right? That will give me in the dr coordinate 1 minus 1, uh, 1 divided by 1 minus 1, right? Because there's an invert power, right? So invert 0, instantly, infinity, right? That's one um, point. Invert 0? Yeah. R of 0 raised to the negative 1 power, right? You've got oh. 1 divided by 0. Right. Or if I set my R to be zero, right? Well, one over zero, kablamo, infinity. So these are what we call singularities in the metric. Basically points that I can set my variables to in order to cause my line element measure to go to infinity. Or really, if I look at the metric here, any quantity that I come up with, will explode because the components explode, right? An area will depend on this. A volume will depend on this. Um, it all gets crazy. Um, it's interesting. Uh, one of these, um, one of these singularities actually is, is in a way fake because it depends on the coordinate system that we're using specifically because we're using the polar coordinates this it's the singularity that pops out and in fact that's the one where r is equal to 2m um the other one when r goes to zero no matter how you transform that no matter and basically i know that the r equals 2m one is fake because i can find coordinates that make that um I can find a coordinate transform that makes that infinity just disappear. No longer matters. I'll show you in a sec. For the r equals zero, I can't do that. So how do I transform that away? Well, simple. I define a new coordinate system, and I define a new coordinate system um, via, uh, let's do, it's v r, this will be challenging for me, theta phi. Um, and the way that I define V is simply by saying, okay, we replace T with V minus R minus 2M there, log the absolute value of R divided by 2M minus 1. Where does that come from? some clever people guessing okay effectively that's fair right like you you guess and he's like and, 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 like that's one of the the fun things is uh you know you can show that a singularity in a metric is fake or coordinate dependent if you can find a coordinate system that doesn't have that um singularity in the mapped spot that it, you know, if I look at the spots that did have that singularity and then look at where that maps to in my new coordinate system. Um, okay, so as long as the radius is equal to 2m, it is not fake and we don't have a right. singularity. It's, it's a, it's a, 
right? Like a coordinate dependent singularity. We'll get to what that means for us here in a second. When I make the substitution for T for this here, I get a new line element, a new um, got metric that defines for me distance. What I get is minus one minus two M over R dv squared plus 2 dv dr uh, plus my two sphere geometry the r squared d theta sine squared r squared d phi don't worry about that that's not it it's maintains the same behavior as before it just is uninteresting for us the only thing that changes is dt dr squared becomes now this function of dv squared and a cross between dv and dr. This is still the same symmetry. Is that the same s? No, 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 no. Sorry, uh, s for two sphere. Let me be more explicit. Two. Okay. Two sphere line. Okay. Basically, like, like it's it's this piece here. I just didn't want to draw it out again. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess technically I've made as many steps. I was trying to just simplify it as S2, but anyways. Okay. All right. Uh, what you'll notice is that um, what you'll notice is that in this metric, the reliance on when r goes to 2m, right? That caused the dr term to explode. Here, and that's because I took the in, you know, the inverse of 1 minus 2m over dr. That metric doesn't depend on the inverse of this at all. So it doesn't blow up when you set r equals to 2m. But it still depends on, right, that direct. Basically, dv and dt... Uh, squared, the the elements that are associated with that component are the same, which means the singularity associated with when r goes to zero is still the same as well. And now, why would we ever expect r to go to zero? If I were to try and apply the Schwarzschild metric to everywhere in the universe, i.e. Um, down to r equals zero, which is what I would I would kind of hope that I could push my theory to be able to do that. Okay, right. Um, in order to have physics that's uniform everywhere, right, and that would be a nice thing. That I, I would like my physical equations to describe every point in the universe, anytime, anywhere, right. Maybe I have to account for different sources of curvature, but I would want my very simple vacuum equation to be able to apply literally to every point in time and space that I could imagine. Well, you're testing the extremes, right? At first, you tested the extreme where R went to infinity, and that had to go to Newton's law in that extreme. And now we're going to the other extreme of R going to zero. It's, it's, a useful, it's useful to understand the limiting behavior. You want... You would push it there because you want your theory to be able to describe it there um and so these two singularities um are the strange singularities that we talk about when we think of black holes these are what define a prediction for a black hole why well for the r equals zero singularity when i go down to r equals zero all my physics breaks down Right. Uh, you know, the you hear things in pop sci about uh, the mass compressing down uh, all mass that's in that black hole down to a single point, which uh, physics, I, I can't um, give you anything meaningful. My metric for figuring out distance and literally anything else explodes to infinity at a single point. And how to make sense of that isn't clear. We don't know how we don't know how to in physics deal with infinities. Right. If, you, if you've ever, you know, I've talked about QFT, right? The whole idea of QFT is to get rid of these infinities that, that pop up 
with your theories, you try and ma marry together quantum mechanics and special relativity. And in order for it to even have a hope of making sense, you have to figure out where to put these infinities that pop up. Now, you can do some really clever tricks, but if you have an infinity that you can't get rid of, you can't make predictions because infinity doesn't map singularly to something, basically. Right. Right. And, and in order for a predictive theory to uh, do this, we want it. The other, the other singularity at R equals M actually corresponds to the 2M. event horizon of the black hole. Is it M or 2M? 2M. Sorry. Okay. Right. It's, it's kind of funny that we measure distances in mass, but hey, this is what geometrized units do for you. It's great. So to see it, um, what you do is to, to see the behavior of this black hole, like how that prediction actually pops out. We'll just really quickly go over it. Um, what you do is you impose and say, okay, I want to, since my, my metric is spherically symmetric, I'm going to assume, I'm going to hold uh, theta and phi as constants. They may as well be zero, but the, the picture of how this metric evolves um, should be the same or how light uh, behaves in this metric should be the same no matter where I am angularly. It should only depend on the distance that I am away from my center. Okay. Um, so what that means is, is that you have to solve the equation one minus two M over R DV squared plus two DV DR equals zero. Um, I hold those constants and I'm interested in light like um, light like world lines, basically ds equals zero, which is what gives me that equation. Okay. Right. Um, there are a few solutions to this. First up, if v is constant, okay, um, and here, oh, here, so time is constant. Yeah. Uh, here, not necessarily. So I'm actually oh, going right. to map myself in. Uh, a space T prime where it's V minus R, right. which is the, the thing, but minus the log part, just ignore that, and then R. Okay, I'm going to write out the map of this. Um, and actually, let me just go ahead and import the picture first. Just make our lives easier. Let's just skip to the final result. There we go. Okay. So one solution... Yeah. One solution is that uh, V is a constant. And what you'll notice on this picture here is that uh, that indicates ingoing light waves, which, tell, which is basically saying, okay, if, if T is increasing, time evolves, then R must decrease in order to keep V constant. Right from this, I can say... Basically, V equals um, T prime plus R. If this goes up and this is constant, this must go down. Okay. Pretty basic logic there. Um, right. Um, right. And, and it's pretty easy to see that, you know, uh, V constant solves this because DV is zero, DV is zero. So zero plus zero is zero. Huzzah. Um, the next solution comes from uh, is V minus two R plus two M log, uh, not two, R over two M minus one, close. This is equal to some constant C as well. If not and, the speed of light C. Yeah. So I'm just constant. Let's okay. call it K. <laughs> Okay, that's that equals some constant, and this actually bends. These are the slightly curved lines you see, right? Uh, kind of like the log function. You expect log functions to curve, depending on whether R 
is greater than 2m or less than 2m, you either have outgoing light waves, light paths, right? So you can see, right. Um, let me just highlight this, right? If, if it's greater, it goes away from the r equals zero term. Um, so talking about this, the pink ones are this, the pink ones are these trajectories, right? Um, but if I am inside the light cone, what I know, or inside that 2M, I notice no matter what path I pick, it always follows down into this R equals zero singularity. And the last solution to this differential equation is if R equals 2M. It's a solution. Because when I plug it in there, right, the dv term that only depends on v, that goes to zero because the coefficient goes to zero. And then you've got a dr term. Well, r is a constant if it's equal to 2m. So that equals zero as well. So zero plus zero equals zero. Aha, I found a solution. That corresponds to exactly the moment where these, these an, log an orbit around. lines right, yeah. are stable. right? It will effectively orbit around. It stays at this constant r. That's your event horizon. Anything outside of that line can get out into the universe, but anything inside of that line gets sucked into the singularity. What's interesting is that as far as what you can tell if you're on the line to M, the local behavior of your system, basically how I would measure physics, nothing changes. It looks the same. If you go into a black hole and you cross its event horizon, to you, locally, right, as far as anything that you could do physics on, nothing will have changed. So you can actually, um, and that's why uh, we think of the singularity that the Schwart that the um, Schwarzschild metric had in polar coordinates, right? In, in GR polar coordinates, that that going to infinity is just a fake singularity because physics doesn't break down at the event horizon. Physics only breaks down when you get down to the center of the black hole. But you wouldn't be able to tell whether you've crossed the event horizon or not. So you wouldn't see weird things like if you emit a, a laser beam, it curves around and nope. Okay. Nope. As far as as far as you could tell, right? As far as you would be able to measure according to vanilla GR. There's a lot of theories of, about that that stack on top of GR to try and resolve things like the information paradox and whatever. We might be able to talk about that later, but for now, this is the ultimate behavior that lets us know, oh, the vacuum equation instantly readily gives us that black holes should be a thing in the universe that we might be able to see these things that suck in all light all information kablamo now you've got the coolest the coolest visual thing you've ever seen about a space cowboy flying around uh through different wormholes to try and save humanity from the dust bolt effect i.e. Interstellar, because that's a great movie. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. But yeah, so that is a deepish dive into the Schwarzschild metric. You can derive it exclusively from looking at the, um, at looking at the Ricci curvature and saying that Ricci curvature must equal zero. Kablam. Very cool. All right. Uh, next time, we're just going to look at how do I finish deriving the right-hand side of the Einstein equation. We'll see you there.